Okay, uh, can hear. Okay, uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for the organizing committee for inviting me to be a speaker and present on uh, this topic of basic arterial blood gas interpretations. So uh, I hope this uh, topic will benefit for the junior uh, medical officers as well as the house officers and all the healthcare personnel uh, while battling with this uh, pandemic condition. And as we know, the arterial blood gas is one of the most important one of the most important um, data that we can extract from the patient from time to time while they need the oxygen supplementations. So, uh, so the interpretation is actually very important for us to make a decision where shall this patient go. So uh, I was previously, uh, I, after my uh, passing at my final, I was uh, 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 posted to Hospital Miri for one and a half years. And uh, during this pandemic, uh, I was uh, volunteered to go to Hospital Paka Kanakana. And uh, I'm there for almost uh, one and a half months uh, so far. So the, for my topic of the day, this is my outline. I'll go from the introduction, then uh, indications, uh, sorry. Uh, indications and the sampling, interpretation of the result, acid-base balance, cases, and also some take-home messages. So uh, what is arterial blood gas? Actually, ABG is one of the measures of the oxy, uh, is one of the measures, okay, to, me uh, to check the patient's uh, oxygen tensions, which is a PaO2, carbon dioxide uh, tensions uh, in the blood, as well as the acidity, hemoglobin saturations, and also the bicarb's concentration in the arterial blood gas. In some setting, uh, some of the arterial blood gas has other extra data, such as a hemoglobin, hematocrit, sodium, potassium, chloride, lactate, as well as a base excess. So when we're interpreting this data, always uh, we need to correlate with the patient clinical conditions, as well as the ventilator settings, what is the FIO2 that we are having for this patient, and the last part, do, do not forget about the trend of the arterial blood gas, which will determine which direction this patient is going, either to be getting better or is getting worse in a, uh, some of the scenario. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, as for indications, uh, it's used to identify and also monitor the uh, acid base uh, disturbance and also measure the partial arterial of our oxygen and also the CO2. You can quantify the hemoglobin level and also the, as a blood sampling in an acute emergency conditions as well. And uh, when do you, when the, the contraindication of it is, uh, when you have an abnormal uh, modified Allen test of the patient's uh, artery, uh, local infections, thrombus, uh, distorted anatomy, then you don't take the arterial blood gas from the artery, uh, artery side. Uh, severe peripheral vascular disease, or even the active uh, Raynaud uh, syndrome. Now, at here, I would like to emphasize one thing, again, especially during the, uh, when you're pricking the patients on taking the arterial blood gas. So uh, one of the tests you check is to check the Allen test. So as you can see, when before you are taking the arterial blood gas, you need to compress both the radial and also the ulna artery, okay? Just a simple manoeuvres and ask the patient to clench the fingers. Subsequently, unclench the finger to ensure that there's no blood flows to the aquata arteries, which will show the patient's palm to be pale. Subsequently, you release the ulna arteries, okay? To get the repercussions of the uh, circulations in the patient's palm. Now, this is very important as in when you prick or even especially when you insert the radial artery cannula in the ICU setting, a simple test as this can uh, actually help you to prevent the patient's hands to get thrombus and also the uh, avascularizations of the palm, which might eventually end up the amputations of the patient's palms and the patient might lose the hand. So, um, before you do the test, uh, it's important for you to uh, do this uh, Allen test uh, before you uh, pricking the patients or even especially when you're inserting the arterial uh, cannula for the ABG. Now, when, you in, when we're interpreting the ABG data, there's a few things that we are looking for. First of all, we look for the oxygenations and also the ventilations, followed by the acid-base disorders 
And the last part are the electrolytes and also the hemoglobin abnormalities. Now, let's go on to the first one, the oxygenations. Uh, the normal parameters for the ABG, we always take the pH 7.35 to 7.45, the PaO2 about 75, but this gets a bit changes during the uh, COVID condition. Most of our patients, we target our PaO2 about more than 60s in the, uh, especially the COVID ARVS conditions. Some even we go up to lower, such as 25 millimeter mercury. PaCO2 in the general condition, we target about 35 to 45. But as for ARVS, you can go permissive hypercarbia. And the bicarb normal range is about 21 to 27. These parameters are for the normal parameter for normal patients. Now, as we go to the oxygenations, which is the most important part in this part of the talk, we need to know how well is a patient's partial arterial oxygen concentrations. So from here, we have uh, two uh, parts of the, uh, the data that we can see from the ABG, which is a KO2 and the SAO2. Now, this you need to calculate the index of the oxygenation, which is the AA gradients and also the partial arterial oxygen divided by the fraction of inspired oxygen ratio, which is a PF ratio that we always mention. What is the PF ratio of the patient? So you take the PAO2 of that patient at that time divided by what are the FIO2 that you provide for the patients at the time. Now, it doesn't mean that the, that the patient PAO2 is 80, is adequate for that patient. When the patient is receiving FIO2 of one, it, sh it only shows that the patient is in worsening of the hypoxic conditions. So this ratio is a very important um, um, data that we need to use it to guide us where are we going for these patients. Now, as for the respiratory failure, when the patient PO2 is low, we divided the respiratory failure in two components, which is a type 1 respiratory failure as well as a type 2 respiratory failure. Now, as for the type 1 respiratory failure, usually it happens due to the lung failure and causes the type 1 hypoxemic respiratory failure. Usually commonly happen among the ARDS patients, like our COVID patients, pulmonary edema, or even the right to left shunt. Now, followed by the second type, the ventilatory failure, which is the alveolar failure. It happens among the patient who has a COPD, asthma, or hypoventilation, or even some of the conditions such as a neuromuscular disease, where they comes with type 2 hypercarbic respiratory failure together with the hypoxemia, okay? Their oxygen is low and their CO2 is already very high. So you can see among all these uh, type 2, uh, the, the alveolar ventilatory failure patients. Now, in uh, COVID-19, uh, associated with the ARDS conditions, you can always see that the, we use the Berlin's criteria to definite the ARDS, which is the acute onset less than one week, with the chest X-ray bilateral uh, lung infiltrations, not from the heart origin and the volume are uh, overloaded. And the last part is our PF ratio, which will, inter uh, which will determine the severity of the ARDS. So by looking at the PAO2 over the FIO2 ratio, you will see when there's a mild condition, your PF ratio is about 200 to 300. When there's a moderate, which is 100 to 200, and when it's a severe, it is less than 100. So this PF ratio is an important data that would determine us which are the severity of the patient. And as for you all have known, PF ratio of less than 150 might indicate that this patient might need a prone position. So maintaining the patient PF ratio is very important. Now, if we go to this uh, hypoxic respiratory failure in managing the COVID patients, now you can see that the oxy, uh, as the graph, uh, as the chart goes down, you may see that the, the patients, the uh, requirement of the interventions of the patients is getting more and more advanced. For started from the nasal prong with the face mask oxygen and also subsequently to high flow nasal cannula oxygenation, 
then go to the NIP. Now, in these conditions, you most of the time, the patient will be in the mild to moderate ARBS, where your PF ratio is about 200, uh, 200 to even up to 300. And in this kind of condition, you may actually ask the patient to self prone and uh, consider uh, the uh, uh, increase of the oxygenations or even add on a little bit of PEEP in the CPAP condition if you are have an isolation room. However, when the patient PF ratio is getting lower and lower, you might need to consider early intubate the patients with the subsequent mechanical ventilation strategy. Now, when the PF ratio is less than 150, you might need to even prone the patients for more, about 16 hours with mus uh, muscular, uh, neuromuscular blockade. And if the condition is even much more worsened, the lung is all gone, you might even need to consider for ECMO in some of the tertiary hospital settings. So with all this data could be um, taken, uh, can be retrieved from the, our ABG. So there's no reason why we don't, um, don't look at our ABG carefully and look at our PAO2, which is the most important data. Now, next, we follow by our acid and base disorder. When you take the ABG, one of the first most, uh, uh, one of the first uh, important um, the, the data that they show up there is our pH. Now, what is the normal pH? Uh, as we have mentioned, the normal pH is about 7.35 to 7.45. So if you are, go beyond these two arms, you are either following become an acidosis or become an alkalosis. Now, when a patient is a acidosis or even an alkalosis, you need to, in, uh, you need to define what type of acidosis or what type of alkalosis this patient has been. Then uh, subsequently, you need to calculate what are the compensation, whether is it compensate or non-compensated. Now, in our body, physiologically, we can maintain, there's a, we can maintain our acid-base balance. Our body has a buffer systems, which is uh, open in the, um, at the ends of the buffer uh, end of the buffer systems, which will help us to maintain the no pH in the normal range by buffering the acid in the extracellular fluid and also the intracellular fluid by respiratory and also the renal compensations. And the mechanism of the buffering and the respiratory compensation actually occurs quite rapidly within minutes to hours, where else our renal compensation occurs much more slower. Usually it takes up to hours or even up to days. So this is our uh, basic uh, the, the, um, chemistry uh, formula, where when you have, a, as we know, uh, when we have a normal metabolism, our end products of a metabolism is your carbon dioxide with the water. So this will form some of the carbonic acids. And in our plasma, it will dissociate it into acid as well as the base. So this is basically our body bicarb buffer system, which opens in two ends. So as you can see here, our normal pH is 7.35 to 7.45. Now, if the patient is having the high or the rise of the PCO2, the patient will be having a respiratory acidosis. Now, in order to compensate with the respiratory acidosis, the body will start to increase the bicarbonate absorptions. Okay? This is the body metabolic compensation. Hence, this could uh, cause the patients uh, to maintain the normal pH range. On the other hand, if the patient pH is low, you need to see whether the patient is having a low bicarb. And if the bicarbonate is low, this patient might be having a metabolic acidosis. And most of the time, the patient would get the respiratory compensations by hyperventilations in order to wash out most of the CO2. Then it can maintain the patient in the normal pH range. Now, followed by, if you have a patient who have a pH more than 7.45, you need to see which arm that they goes, either the low PCO2 
where the patient has respiratory alkalosis become hyperventilating. Now, when patient is hyperventilating, he needs to compensate metabolically uh, by metabolic to decrease the bicarb absorption. Hence, you become compensated with the metabolic acidosis. On the other hand, if the patient, uh, the pH is more than 7.45 with the raise of the bicarb, the patient will be having a metabolic alkalosis. By doing so, the patient will have the respiratory compensation with hypoventilations. By reducing the respiratory rate, it will increase the PaCO2 in the body in order to compensate with the metabolic alkalosis. So this is how the to homeostasis the conditions of the acid and base conditions. After look so, okay, sorry. Uh, on the other part, you can actually look at the Davenport diagram. So the you can actually from here you can see the number a uh, the, the the a point here is actually showing the patient is at the four at the graph PCO2 about 40. Now when wherever the patient goes, we will always try to keep the patient at this line of 7.4. Now for example, if the patient is going to be more metabolic acidosis, it will follow this line, comes down, will become a met more metabolic acidosis. But at the same time, the body will start to condensate with the respiratory condensation, which is percolation. And thus, the pH will start to increase after that. So you can see that the patient has fallen into this graph where your PCO2 has become about 20. And your bicarb line is in the lower setting, probably about 10 to 15. Another example, if a patient is having a respiratory, uh, respiratory acidosis, so from the A point, the patient will go up. Okay? For an A point, the patient will go up, become more acidosis, and the CO2 has climbed up from the 40 line, goes up to the 60 line. In order to compensate, the renal will start to compensate with by increasing the bicarbonate in the body. Hence, the plasma bicarb will slowly climb up into the rate, into the um, almost up to 40 millimole when the PCO2 is almost up to 60. So this is how our body works as a buffer compensation system by respiratory, also the uh, renal compensation. Sorry. Now, uh, for the respiratory acidosis, so you always when we have uh, acidosis, no matter which type of uh, arms that we are having, always the ABG is only showing us what are these patients having. As a clinician, our, our role is to find out what is the underlying cause and treat the cause accordingly, but not the numbers from the ABG. So, from... Um, up, uh, subsequently, uh, I'll go, out, go through with you what are the possible causes for all this. Now, for the respiratory acidosis, we you know the possible causes is always from the, uh, we always divided the causes from the brain, go to the lower lung, okay, lower uh, respiratory uh, tract of the lung. So it could be due to the inhibitions of the respiratory center, where, as for example, maybe the patient was uh, over sedated or even the barbiturates or there's a lesion in the central nervous system, or even patient has a sleep apnea, or patient, uh, when the patient is having a, or the patient might be having a disorder in the respiratory muscles, such as guillain barre or multiple sclerosis, or the patient has a lower airway obstruction, such as aspiration, or septic sleep apnea, or even angiospasm. Or the last part, maybe the nasal gas exchange problems, such as ARDS, COPD, pulmonary edema, or even the pneumonia. So all this can cause the hypoventilations of the patients, which leads to the retentions of the CO2. Now, in order to know the whether it's acute or chronic, we need to see if there's an acute raise of the CO2 
usually they will increase the bicarb in one milli equilibrium per liter. But as for chronic, in every increase of the 10, it would chronically can compensate with raise of the bicarb by four. Next, uh, you go to uh, respiratory acidosis. So the patients uh, can be caused due to stimulation of the medullary respiratory center, such as tumor, stroke, sepsis, or the salicylate poisoning, or even can be due to the hypoxemia, such as high altitude or even pulmonary or the, the other part, our mechanical ventilation, we over high minute ventilations, ventilating the patients. So uh, as for the compensations, you can see even the acute condition, every race of decrease of the stand of the PCO2 will decrease our bicarb by two. On the other hand, every in the chronic conditions, every decrease stand of the PCO2, you decrease your bicarb by four. Okay, as for metabolic alkalosis, uh, metabolic alkalosis can happen uh, due to loss of the, uh, so, uh, the, the acid in the gastric, uh, gastric part. So especially in the patient who is uh, the system vomiting, hyperaldosteronism, you chronically put a patient in the NG free flow or the villous edema, which causes the patients are losing a lot of acid. Or you increase the bicarb ingestions or infusion in the body, such as uh, you give a bicarb infusions, okay, or even cause disease or mood alkaline syndrome. Or the other part is the volume contraction of the alkalosis, such as if you are chronically putting the patient on fusamide or even thiazide. So how do we know how we check the compensation is by using the Winters formula, <laughs> where our expected PCO2 will be equal to your 0 0.7 multiplied by the bicarb plus 20. Okay, this will check out how much is the PCO2 for that patient. The last part, the metabolic acidosis, which is one of the most common uh, conditions for most of our patients. It shows that the patients in the ABG where they have a decrease of the bicarb concentration in the blood as a result of either you increase production or injection of the acid or you lost bicarb or inability to excrete the um, acid in the kidney, especially in the kidney failure patients. Hence, uh, you need, when the patient having a metabolic acidosis, you might need to even check your NIO gap or smaller gap or even the delta gap. Now, the winter formulas is also being used again to check for the respiratory compensation. In order to know what's the expected uh, PCO2, you need to use a formula 1.5 multiplied by the bicarb plus 8 and plus minus 2. That will show how much is the expected PACO2 of this patient supposed to be. Now we go to the N ion gap. As we know, the N ion gap, uh, you need to calculate it to know what are the miscellaneous N ion that increases the gap in the acid base conditions. So the formula would be sodium plus potassium minus the chloride and minus the bicarb, okay? Sodium plus potassium minus bicarb and also the chloride. Now, the miscellaneous part, and it can be contributed by the other factors. If the end ion gap is very large, okay? You will need to find out what are the possible causes for having a such a large end ion gap in the severe metabolic conditions. And the high end ion gap metabolic acidosis, these are the possible causes, such as ketone, salicylate, or the metabolic from the toxic alcohol, acetate, oxalate, or even retain the non volatile acid, such as urate, phosphate, and so on. We have a mnemonic for it. We usually use uh, mud pulse or cat mud pulse, which shows that the uh, high end get metabolic acidosis can be due to either we can cyanide, carbon monoxide, or even the amino glycoside, methanol, urea, DKA, which is one of the common causes, the starvation, ketoacidosis as well, your PCM, paracetamol poisoning, your eye is your iron, or even your isonazide, or your metabolism, or even the ethanol or the lactic acidosis. Okay. So in a nutshell, this 
can be uh, used as a uh, uh, to uh, what they call it uh, to check the compensations of it. Now, what I've mentioned in the PaCO two, when you get the PaCO two, you check your expected uh, and severe metabolic acidosis. You check your expected CO two, and when some metabolic alkalosis, also use a winter formula by checking what is the expected CO two as well. When there's a respiratory acidosis, there's an acute. When it, there's a chronic, there's a suppose there's some alter changes of your bicarb changes. Uh, bicarb. And as for respiratory alkalosis in a chronic acute condition, you drop your bicarb by two and chronic decrease by five. Now I'm going to share with you some of our cases uh, that we have uh, in our uh, center. Uh, I mean the center of uh, where I practice. So I'll um, just quickly go through with you all. Uh, all these are the live, uh, I mean, uh, our true patients. Uh, okay. Uh, then uh, from there, you can see what are the what is the ABG and also try to uh, find out uh, which type of condition this patient has. Now, we have uh, one first of our patients uh, with a pH of 7.3, PCO2 of 55, PO2 of 108, and you can see the bicarb is 29. Okay. This is one of our uh, patients who have a respiratory acidosis with a CO2 retentions and compensated with our bicarb metabolic alkalosis. Okay. So it's a 33-year-old gentleman with uh, no medical problems, got 12 days of illness in COVID category 5 with two days of ICU emissions. And uh, he was admitted to us because he has a uh, type 2 respiratory failure with a high CO2 and a low oxygenation. He was intubated, he was sent to for scan, shows that he has a severe organizing pneumonia from the HRCT. And as you can see, this is his uh, HRCT scan. You can see actually both the lungs actually uh, very badly uh, crown glass appearance with the interlobular changes of the opacity, as well have the, as well as uh, there are also the bronchial wall uh, thickening as well. So this patient, uh, that's why it shows that the patient has a, a type two respiratory failure. Okay, it's a very common in among our COVID patients. Now, second ABG. You have a patient who have a pH of 7.3, PCO2 of 11, bicarb of 6, potassium of 6.5, okay, lactate of 1.3. So from the ABG here, it actually shows that the patient is having a metabolic acidosis with a bicarb 6.4. Now, and also the compensation by having a hyperventilation to drop the PCO2. In order to get the pH of seven point near seven point three five, this is actually our one of our patient of a fifteen year old girl who has a type one res, uh, type one uh, diabetic mellitus came here with a respiratory distress. In ED, the RR is about two to fifty on high flow mass, and the ABG shows uh, the metabolic acidosis compared to the respiratory alkalosis as well. The serum ketone is a six point two with hyperkalemia, and she was diagnosed as severe DKA. So she was uh, treated with the insulin and then subsequently was able to discharge. Okay. Now as for case, the third example, we have a 16 year old patient with a nine day of ICU emission called category five with the lung shows as a moderate, mod, uh, moderate organizing pneumonia. He was uh, extubated. Okay. Okay, sorry. The is it still recording? Okay. So this patient, uh, in during the stay in our ICU, there's no uh, moderate organizing pneumonia. There's no pulmonary embolism. He was extubated on the day three of ICU and went from high flow nasal cannula to face mask. He was she was supposed to be discharged in the afternoon. However, there was a sudden collapse of this patient. Subsequently, she was intubated and then was started on resuscitations. From a face mask 5 liter, she just suddenly collapsed, intubated, and resuscitated. So this was her ABG during her resuscitation. As we can see, the pH is really 6.9 with a PCO2 of 80, PO2 of 54.8, and the bicarb is about 17. And uh, if we look at our ventilator setting, if you can see here carefully, the end tidal CO2 is only 35 compared with our PCO2 of 80. 
Hence, there was a very great discrepancy between the anhydr and also the PaCO2. That means this patient, despite having a mini ventilation of 10 liter, is, all this ventilation is actually just a dead space ventilation. And actually from the scan itself, shows that the patient having a D shape of the left ventricle with a di severely dilated uh, right ventricle. And the four chamber view, there's a grossly dilated of the RV. And actually the patient is having a, a massive pulmonary embolism. Uh, despite she had received a Kaixin 60 daily, she still developed a pulmonary embolism. During the collapse event, she was CPR for three cycle, uh, duration about 45 minutes. And uh, unfortunately we lost her Despite eight days of the ICU admission successfully to lead down with face mask, however, she still passed away with a massive pulmonary embolism. Okay, so from the ABG, you can from the previous ABG, you can see the patient is having a severe respiratory acidosis. Okay, so um, in a conclusion, for the take-home message, uh, from here I would like to share with you all, the, the take-home message will be. Actually, there's plenty of information you can gain from the ABG, such as oxygen, CO2, bicarb, pH, and also the electrolytes. Always correlate the ABG with the oxygen therapy, such as and also your ventilation strategy and also the trend. Now, remember, please, ABG is only part of the patient assessment. Always go to examine the patient and go clinically. Treat the patient underlying cause of the acidosis, CO2 raise, or even the low oxygen. After the pricking of the artery, please do a compression over the arterial side. Okay, avoid the uh, aneurysm formations, especially in the brachial or even the femoral side. Repeat exercise on the uh, digit interpretation is actually important. So every day when you are seeing a patient, we, uh, when you see the ABG, try to interpret yourself and then look for your oxygen and the AB, uh, acid base compensation. Okay, with this, I end my talk. I hope uh, it can help you out uh, in the future in terms of uh, interpreting the ABG for the patients. Thank you very much. Sorry, it's a bit uh, over the timing. Okay, thank you.